What's the answer to the question? Who are we? Why are we here? What happens when we die? Where do we go? Are ghosts real? Are there other worlds, physical, spiritual? These are just some of the questions we'll try to answer. And all we ask is you keep it open mind. Welcome to The Question. My name is Oscar Osbo, your host today. One of the things we're going to talk about today is something on everyone's mind. Are there really ghosts? Are ghosts real? Well, we talked to Linda Alice Dewey, who wrote a book called Aaron's Crossing, A True Ghost Story. And we'll visit Linda at her home and ask her the question. Are there really ghosts? And tell us about your true ghost encounter. So here we go with Linda Alice Dewey. Right, we're here with Linda Alice Dewey, author of Aaron's Crossing, wonderful book that I'm going to read, and we're here in the uh, beautiful Lake Michigan. Now, where exactly are we located? We're uh, just west of uh, the beautiful town of Glen Arbor, Michigan, near Traverse City in Leelanau County. And we're in the backyard, your backyard. Yes, we are. Actually, not, we not call this yard. the front yard. The front yard? Oh, yeah. this is the front yard. Right. The house faces the lake, but everybody gets that mixed up because you'd think that it faces the road. And we have a little bug visiting. We have a too. friend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, as far as the, the book goes, why don't, you, why don't you explain exactly how it all got started? Because uh, you are, as we, you told us, you're a, 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 a teacher, as far as a music teacher and a uh, reading, reading teacher. Reading, reading, right. Now, as far as writing this book, how did it all come about? Well, that's a, that's a big question. First of all, I didn't believe in ghosts at all. I was raised uh, on the adage that there's no such thing as ghosts. And uh, so uh, it, it, it was a long journey to get to the point where I would even think that that was possible. So in 1987 or so, um, I was introduced to uh, the new metaphysics, uh, uh, which are really the old earth religions and, and a spirituality in general. And, and you get away from uh, religion and you get into spirituality. It's a much broader topic. And I started changing some of my um, uh, thoughts about um, channeling, about um, crystals, about energy. I started learning about these things and understanding. And one of the things was... Um, about people and entities that we can't see that are here. Um, they're all around us. They've always been all around us. It's not new until you realize that it really is true, and it's new to you, but it's always been. So I had this experience um, in, in a cemetery near here, about a mile from my home. I didn't know about it. It was an abandoned cemetery, and um, uh, there was a ghost there, and we could feel it. Um, and I had never had a ghost encounter before. And this is Aaron. I'll eventually find out that his name was Aaron. And I'll learn his whole story, which is what this book is about. This is really his story, not mine. Why do you think these entities, these spirits, why are they left here? Well, Aaron explained it to me uh, when, when he came back and, and, and told me his whole story after he had crossed, that um, most of them most people, when they pass on, do cross over to the next dimension. But um, some who have not, either they have unfinished business, they have um, uh, problems that they haven't resolved inside of themselves, 
um, or they have a, a great attachment maybe to somebody that's still living or an attachment to a home or an attachment to the life experience that they're not willing to let go of and move on. And a lot of times they don't realize it. Some don't even know they're ghosts. Okay. So the, do some of them, do they have to solve their problem first before they go on? Or? Generally, they, they, we all came here, and this is what I'm learning, is that we, we all came here for a purpose, to learn something at the gut level. Um, we knew before we came here what we were going to try to experience when we were here. And then we're born, and by the age of three or four, we've forgotten. They call it the veil. We've, we've forgotten, and we're meant to forget. So that when we go through these experiences, we'll get it at the gut level like you could never get it any other way. We go through this blindly finding our way and finding purpose and really getting it. Um, we could be doing this some other way, but like, like knowing what the last page is in, in a book that, that you're reading, and it takes away the experience of going through it. Okay. Kind of like a kid burns his hand on the stove and says, okay, he, he learns it's hot. That's exactly right. And, and you can get it here at, at such a deep level because you're going through it blindly trying to find answers, and the answers are there, and, and that's one of the things that Aaron said. This is, he came back to me five years after he crossed. I woke up one morning with this voice in my head that I heard saying, Aron, Aron, wake up, boy, you're coming after me. And I thought, oh my God, this is, I knew this would be a book. It was so extraordinary, my experience. Well, my experience is only a, a very small part of, of what this book is. It's his story from from the time that, that he was brought over here at the age four when he was kidnapped, all the way through his life and his great love, terrible mistake that he made, his death, and then when he realizes he's a ghost and what he has to work out inside of himself. But he says, when I look back on it now, I can see the beauty of it all. Even having to be a ghost, he could see the purpose in that. And he says it's like the blink of an eye, this whole lifetime, including the decades that he was a ghost. Now, on that side, it's like the blink of an eye, but oh, what he got from it. Why do you, why do you feel that he had to explain his story to you, though? He explained it in detail. It sounds like that you got a whole book on it. He, he did. He came back and he explained it in detail. And I, it's, it's my belief that um, he, um, we became very um, connected. And he was just with me for two weeks before he crossed over. In that time, I took him from here through the changing planes in St. Louis and, and, and all the way to Phoenix to, to find this person to help us, only to find out that she wouldn't be able to help us. And we figured out a different way, but we became very close. And I think that he felt that maybe it was payback because I had all these questions and I could hear him. And I think it was part of his growing. I think it's part of his, um, maybe his karmic, maybe it was payback for how I helped him. And it, look at how it, it's helping so many people. So many people are writing me now because the experiences that he went through, even though they're a hundred or more years old, are, are common human experiences that we all go through. The man turned into, he's a protagonist, he's the good guy, but he was really a bad guy, but we get to see why. He, he did those things, and it's like all of us. We all make mistakes. We turn into people that we don't think we're going to turn into. We, we criticize our parents, and then we turn into our parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't think that we're going to end up that way, and he was the same way. And he needed to come back so that we can begin to explain. What a gift. As far as uh, how long he was here after he died, did he tell you anything about the story while he was here, would he just hang out in the cemetery? What did he do? The first half of the book is his life. Okay. Okay. The second half of the book is his afterlife. And he uh, he died down in Ohio. He um, he had lived up here uh, and uh, made a, a terrible mistake. Uh, he abandoned his family after his wife died. He couldn't bear to look at his children because he saw her face. And so he went, he, he left them in the care of a good person. He knew that they would be cared for. He was devastated when his wife died. And he left and he went down to Ohio. 
and he worked, he was an itinerant worker and uh, worked for many years be going between Ohio and down to Georgia back and forth uh, seasonally until he died. Um, and it tells how he died and then he realizes immediately that he's a ghost because he's, uh, he's standing up looking at himself and, and there are people pointing at him and he looks down and there's his body. And then uh, he tells what his process was, how he learned the ropes of being a ghost. Okay, so why don't, why don't we take a trip to the cemetery? Great idea. Let's go. It was very, very, very still. We didn't have the sunlight coming through. It was after dinner. The sun was going down over there to the west, and, uh, and it had this eerie green glow. Um, to it, and no bird singing. It was absolutely still. Today it feels alive, but back then it felt dead. So uh, we were walking along, and now, if you stop and look in the woods, uh, normally you wouldn't see it, and you're walking along, and all of a sudden these graves start popping up almost. They pop out of, of the background, and you see that they're in the middle of the, this woods, uh, uh, these trees are not very big. The very biggest ones probably are virgin wood. The rest of it uh, was logged. Um, and it was a wonderful man that logged this place that left a few trees here and there. Um, but it, it, let's walk up there and I want to show you what it was like. Right about this spot um, is where Lisbeth turned. Um, I was behind her and she said, uh, someone's here. Uh, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. And then I knew what she was talking about, and I, I knew it was somebody that we couldn't see. And I kind of tuned in. I knew how to tune in with my energy. And suddenly I could feel this um, terrific uh, sadness and this heaviness in the air. And it, it almost made you want to cry. I mean, once you tuned into it, you could feel the grief. And so we walked around the cemetery, and... Uh, and then she did something very strange, and I'll take you to that place. I love this place. This is where I came the year after, on the anniversary, first anniversary of 9-11. I felt that I needed to go someplace sacred, just to remember them right at that time. <laughs> I'm getting very emotional today. I, so I came here and, uh, and spent some time here. Why didn't you just cross them over yourself? I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. I, I knew someone in Arizona, we had been doing metaphysical, you know, been in little groups and doing things for about four years, and I knew somebody that did ghost work, okay. whatever that was. And it was not exorcism. That's a very violent right. thing to do um, to a spirit. And this was actually helping them cross over. I didn't know that we were going to end up doing it ourselves. Lisbeth came and stayed with me for four months. She's an amazing channel. Um, I learned to channel, then she learned to channel, and we would channel together. And she has these wonderful guys, one named Simeon, and, and he gave me better instruction on how to do it and how I would learn to do it myself. He didn't tell me how, but I did. I started to learn how to do it, and I asked to be able to feel them. And so now I get either the scalp prickling or the skin crawling, and that's since I asked. You know, all you have to do is ask. And if it's God's will, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, if it's not, you don't want it anyway, because God has a better plan. You know, God, man plans and God laughs. Now, what about Aaron? Well, Aaron was here, and that's really a, a mystery uh, in the book. Uh, he was here finally at the end of his journey. He had, he didn't die here. Um, he died down in Ohio, but he had lived here, and his wife was buried here. And he was told, and now I'm giving away a secret in the book, uh, and I'm not real comfortable doing that because it keeps people reading because it's a mystery, but he was told by another ghost that he, they had seen other people taken across if they would stay at the grave of a loved one and, um, and stay there and, and ask them to come and concentrate on the loved one. And, and uh, so he was at his wife Susanna's grave asking it and she never came uh, but I did because I I had a lesson to learn and and he had a, a final test and that was about trusting and to trust me someone from another culture 
I mean, really, we are another culture from 100 years ago. Uh, to trust me and to go with me across the country and change planes in the airport in St. Louis and end up in Phoenix, a place he never wanted to go, um, because I said that I knew somebody that could help him cross over, uh, that was a pretty good test of trust, I would say. Looking up this path now, approaching this gated part of the cemetery, and you see there's a, a footstone to one grave and a headstone to another grave and something over there. Um, and uh, we came up here and started walking um, through the cemetery and uh, Lisbeth, and we were reading the stones, and Lisbeth drops to one knee, genuflex, and she's Jewish. And I said, Lisbeth, and she has, she's definitely not, you know, Christian, she's Jewish. And um, I, she stood up and I walked up to her and I said, Lisbeth, why did you do that? And she looked at me and she said, because I had to. And her eyes were, were really dilated. She was kind of in an altered state, I think. And, uh, you know, you can't question that. Anything, no, that? no, I think she was moved to do it, and she, but she doesn't remember doing it. Okay. Even to this day, she does not remember doing that. Lisbeth was with me in 1991, my brother uh, and our kids. Um, the last time I came and, and called out to him, was actually the third time, and that was 1995, four years later. And uh, I asked them, do you guys feel anything here? You know, and, and it, they weren't sensitive to energy and, or anything, but I thought they might feel something, and they all said, no. Oh. And so they all started to leave, and as they were leaving, um, I got about to this spot, and I turned around, and I just could not leave again, knowing that he was there, um, and feeling so sad without letting him know that someone cared. Excuse me. So I stopped and I turned around and I looked back here and I thought, oh my goodness, all by himself. And I thought, what can I say that would just tell him that, that I know and that I care? And so I called out. I stopped right then and I called out. Everybody else was gone down the path. It was getting dark. I called out, whoever's here, our hearts are with you. And then I thought, oh my goodness, was that a wise thing to do? Maybe if he, if he is there, did I disturb something that shouldn't be disturbed? Because all of a sudden I got this feeling that something started happening. And if he wasn't there, well, my friends are walking down there and I'm calling, whoever's here, you know, and it's kind of, I didn't know whether to feel creeped out or stupid, you know, or get corny. And um, they're all going down the path and way down the path. It's getting dark. I'm starting to get creeped out and I'm thinking, I got to go. And so I said, wait up, you guys. And, you know, I hurried up, hurried up to get with them. And I constantly felt somebody behind me. And I thought, this is my imagination. This, this, this is just, you know, my imagination's running wild. And he couldn't, no, that couldn't possibly be. And we all got in the car. And I thought, where would he sit? The car's packed, you know. And no, he couldn't be with us. <laughs> and we get back to the cottage. And um, we get out of the car. And I completely dismiss it, thinking, you know, that was just imagination until the next day. So this cemetery um, is a special cemetery for a lot of reasons. There was a book written about it by Len Obermeyer called uh, the Forest Haven Cemetery. And Forest Haven is the road uh, where the gates are, uh, that, where we came in. And um, there are a lot of Civil War veterans buried here. And some of the graves are marked by little flags. And these flags are new, I think, this year. I, the state of Michigan flag, I, I have not seen that before. But there are more graves here in this area right here, then you can see, I, I took a stick and uncovered those two right there. I really love those two because they're just flat blocks and somebody took a stick and put their names and, and put at rest and, and uh, there's a husband and a wife and then many years later you can see that somebody put a, a, a nice head, a gravestone there between them and, and two small headstones. Um, but, but there are different uh, Civil War veterans um, buried here. I thought this was a family area, and it's possible that this fenced in area could be. They did that back then. But then there are other gravestones there, but most of the gravestones are gone. And Aaron told, tells me in his story, he tells me about his life and afterlife and why he was a ghost and what it was like and what he had to come to terms with inside of himself in order to be, before I got there. 
And um, he tells me that um, the vandals, kids, usually um, teenagers, came and would steal them as trophies, the headstones. I, I'm sure kids still do that kind of thing. And um, But then I talked to Len Obermeyer, who, who wrote this book, The Forest Haven Soldiers, and he said that there are some Irish buried here. He did see the records uh, before they were transferred to Never Neverland. And uh, who knows where the records are? I asked for the records from the township. They said the National Park asked for them. I talked to the head of director of the National Park, and they said they never asked for them. So they're in limbo somewhere, just like a lot of the, just like Aaron was. This, this is just, you know, my imagination's running wild, and he couldn't, you know, that couldn't possibly be. And we all got in the car, and I thought, well, where would he sit? The car's packed, you know, and no, he couldn't be with us. And we get back to the cottage, and um, we get out of the car, and I completely dismiss it, thinking, you know, that was just imagination until the next day. Hi, I'm Ray Williams, and we're up here in Glen Arbor, and we're at the cemetery where Linda Alice Dewey discovered the ghost called Aaron. Uh, she's wrote a very famous book about that and we've been invited to do a ghost walk with some mediums and some psychics that's coming along to uh, uh, do a little research. We've also got um, para uh, normal society up here as well doing some reading. So let's take a look and see what's going on. Raise your hand if you've been in one of my workshops before. There we go. Uh, how many of you have been in the ghost walk workshop before? See? At, at repeaters, just... Um, well, I, I have to tell you that this is not going to be quite, quite the same. We'll cover all of the material that we covered before, but I have received some instruction um, that I'm really... Uh, you thought I was going out on a limb before. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's really going to be going out on a limb. Um, I'm already feeling some activity. Our paranormal society name is Wind Spirits Paranormal Society. You can look us up on the web. It's www.windspiritsparanormal.society.com. This is John. He's one of our lead investigators. Um, and he usually is our cameraman. He's also our resident skeptic. You must have one in, in every room. <laughs> although, although some of the things that we have encountered has... Um, has uh, kind of made him more of a believer. This is Barb. Barb is one of our administrators and caseworkers. She helps us with getting um, organized, organization together and um, uh, cases set up. And she also um, runs a, a, like a night vision camera. We don't have the, she has a camcorder that has a night vision camera. We use digital cameras. We use EMF meters, which is electronic magnetic field detectors. And um, th th what that will do, what those do, if anybody is not familiar with them, is you can get a base reading of like walk around the room like a point one or a point two, and all of a sudden over here on this wall you're getting like a 2.5. That's a, that's a big reading. Well. You go and you realize that the fuse box is on the other side of that wall, so it has picked up that energy. Um, there are times uh, where our EMF meters pick up energy where there is no way to explain where that energy is coming from. Two weeks ago, we did, two, three weeks ago, we did a, um, an investigation at the old Preskill Isle Lighthouse, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, the, the lighthouse itself has absolutely no electricity, no power to it, nothing. No bulb in the beacon, nothing. But yet it has been said that you know, on foggy nights and when ships are in peril, that light will come on and guide the ships in. Um, hoping to catch some, oh, we have voice recorders as well, hoping to catch EVPs, which are electronic voice phenomenon. We have caught them in the past. They are on our website if you ever want to listen. Um, we're hoping to catch that. I'm hoping, no flash, <laughs> to get something, and I think I already have, because I, I had quite a heavy feeling. Yeah. And and I was I took pictures here, but I also took pictures here. I was feeling here. We um, investigate paranormal activity, and then we... <laughs> what we call debunk, which could take 
I mean, the lighthouse was close to 30 hours of going through footage, and then we come out with our results and let you know what it is, what the results will be. So, have I answered? That's great. Everybody's Thank you. Yeah. And we're here at the cemetery where Aaron was discovered. Does anybody else feel this? Uh, Sherry, they need it uh, that dimension to be parted just a little bit, like parting the, the Red Sea. Anybody that can do that? Okay, there we go. Let's move, move up here. Somebody just crossed over. Now, what do you think as far as the different readings that you're getting all over? Because it it's warmer right here that we're standing. I came, well, we came, set up the, the uh, tripod, and I pulled out the thermal meter, and it was at 34.2 or something. But as we walked, I didn't realize this was the vortex, but it was at 70 degrees, 70 degrees. So I showed it to John um, from John and Sherry from Evolve, and just to, you know, you got to have proof. This had 70 degrees. Right. And um, I believe that, yeah, something's here. Something shut off my voice recorder. Is that, that's when we were talking about the, the children, right? Okay, we're having trouble. Have, once again, we're having difficulty with the sound out here. We, we had difficulty with the sound. We were out here in the, in the summertime. We're having difficulty in the, in the early winter. Uh, anyway. Which, yeah, which you know is a common phenomenon. Yeah, which we discussed earlier. Okay. And while I was walking over and she was talking with the children in the woods, um, I started to, I asked the children to talk to me on the voice recorder, um, and they clicked the recorder off. Okay, they're, they're going with her because this is dropping right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And also our video camera, we've changed batteries twice, once, twice. The digital camera. The twice. digital camera twice now since yeah. we've been here. Well, they've we, brought, drained. we brought three cameras this time, four cameras actually, just because we had troubles with the Mr. Dependable's camera here. Yeah. That wasn't so dependable when we were here yeah. the first time. There was a Native American on a white horse on top of the hill, and he wanted me to thank Linda for bringing people here and for taking them on the path and for helping his people to cross over. And he said that he was going to light her path to make sure that she could continue to bring people through here and to help. Well, I've, I've had an experience of, you know, I've had this feeling of heaviness in the chest, so I've felt some of the, I've felt some of what's going on with some of the spirits here, um, the death. And yet, there's a, I also feel, a wonderful sense of hope and upliftment because they see that you know we're aware and there are people who want to know more and they're aware of them and willing to assist. We walked up there we got to 60 64.8 degrees and on the way down a little bit it was 65 Ah. My right, my right foot is toasty warm. My left foot is frozen. So I don't know what's up. What's up with that one? Our base reading was 34. Yeah, and we went at one point up to 70. But my conclusion is there's definitely activity out here. It's paranormal activity. It's definitely intelligent. <laughs> Thank you.